The question to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Thank you. And I call Ms Judith Cochran. A key priority within the civil service, and the work of all departments in managing their sickness absence must continue and indeed intensify in some areas to ensure that the targets which are set out in the programme for government are achieved. I have asked my officials to review our Northern Ireland civil service policies and procedures and to consider any changes or strategies that may be necessary to ensure that our ministerial targets are met. Cochran for a supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Given that there are already a number of work life balance initiatives, such as flexi time, in place in the civil service, which would be more than what's on offer um, in the private sector, for example, is the Minister concerned about the level of stress related sick absence? And does he think that this could potentially increase in the coming months um, when more restructuring and reform measures are implemented? Yeah, the, um, thank you. Uh, thank the member for a question, uh, Mr. Speaker. There is a concern that there are so the analysis provided by uh, NISRA, who measure sickness absence uh, figures on our behalf, our sickness absence rates on our behalf, um, show up a lot of interesting issues around um, causes and broken down by uh, gender and um, work, particular work areas. One of the more concerning um, statistics is the fact that stress-related absences account for over 30 per cent of working days lost. I think everybody in the House, I'm sure, would agree that that is a worryingly high number. Um, the, and I, look, I, I appreciate that uh, the civil service is no different to many walks of life and that um, members of staff will face stress and pressures in the work that they do. Uh, and indeed, because it is a reflection of broader society, the stresses and strains of life will be then really reflected in, in, in our workforce. Uh, and the member is right to highlight um, our policies around flexible working, um, work share, um, um, job share initiatives, and so forth, which I think does show that, well, in the first instance, that we are a, we, we would like to consider ourselves a caring, compassionate employer within the civil service. But there are also a range of policies that are in place to try to uh, work around some of those pressures that people will feel in their everyday day lives. Um, and I appreciate that, um, you know, that stress can be caused in, in any work of life. Um, but we are trying our best as a government to try to, to, to mitigate uh, against some of the, the, the problems that, are, that there are there and can be there, and that is done through routine intervention by the Occupational Health Service, um, our Employee Assistance Programme, which is currently delivered by Care Call, for example, or all other initiatives that we're trying to actively take forward to try to reduce the levels of stress. In respect to the voluntary exit scheme itself, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that should or, or it shouldn't in itself, but I appreciate that reform and restructuring in its broadest sense is, is a sensitive issue and does need to be handled with, handled with care. Thank you. And I call Mr. Paul Gervin for a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Minister, for his answer so far. Uh, what percentage of civil servants take no sick days at all? Mr. Speaker, sometimes in the, in the discussion around our, our high but falling levels of, of sickness absence in the civil service, there is sometimes an understandable focus and concentration on those who are off sick. Um, but it, it is worth noting that in the last full year for which we have statistics, so that was 2013-2014, the number of civil servants who, the percentage of civil servants who took no sick days at all throughout the year was 55.3%, and that was up from 52.3% in 2012-2013. In so I think that, that's, a, that's something that I think is, is not often understood or, or appreciated, that well over half of all civil servants are taking no days off a, a year, and that has been consistently that, that figure. What is, is causing uh, our, the figures to be worryingly high, although falling, is the fact that one in ten uh, of those who are off are off for an average of around three months, and that is obviously distorting the overall picture. But I think the member raises a very, very good point. It is worth acknowledging uh, and us all accepting that the vast majority of, of civil servants are taking no time off, or indeed very, very few days off on, on the sick each year. I call Ms Michaela Boyle. Good morning. Um, can I ask the Minister if he would give consideration to exploring new ways um, to the provision of stress management uh, and, and uh, uh, stress redu reducing initiatives, if he would take them forward uh, and explore that within his department? Good morning. 
Uh, yeah, we, we are, as I um, mentioned in response to Mrs. Cochran and, and, and her question, it is accounting for, for around a third of all sickness absence. Stress is clearly something that we want to, to focus on and, and find out what the reasons behind that are, what, what initiatives or policies we can put in place to try to alleviate it. Uh, and there was a, a Northern Ireland uh, civil service wide stress survey carried out in 2014, the previous one having been conducted five years. Uh, previously. The service is being managed by a cross-departmental working group <coughs> whose role is to develop a response to the survey findings on behalf of their department and feedback best practice and shared experiences. Uh, and, and this is something that we frequently find in handling uh, sickness absence, that there can be very good practice and the best practice in some departments where you see then a measurable decrease in the number of people who, uh, numbers of members of staff who are off sick. And it is sometimes about sharing that best practice. Now, sometimes that won't work. And, in every single department, but um, there are good practices going on. It is all about sharing those across the board, uh, and in dealing with stress, that's no different. And a civil service-wide stress action plan is also being developed and has been included uh, as a key action point in the civil service people strategy, which we are in the in the middle of um, rolling out now. So uh, we're very, very keen to to do all that we can, whether that be innovative. Our, our new um, policies to try to address particularly stress, but not just stress, but indeed sickness absence right across the board. And before we move to the next question, can I inform members that question five has been withdrawn? And I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number two, please. With uh, your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take questions two and 12 together as they relate to the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Members will recall that as part of the draft budget, I announced my intention to establish a Northern Ireland investment fund. I am pleased to report that significant progress has been made since then. A DFP-led project board has been set up, which also includes representatives from DSD, DETI, InvestNI, and the Strategic Investment Board. This project board met before Christmas and will now meet regularly as the project advances. The first key milestone in establishing the investment fund is the completion of a feasibility study. Consultants Deloitte were appointed on the 3rd of February to take forward the study and work is now underway. They have previous experience in advising on the establishment of similar funds and are well placed to deliver the study. I expect this study to conclude in late May and I look forward to consider its conclusions and recommendations. I call Ms Claire Sugden to ask it. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to ask the Minister, was the Northern Ireland Investment Fund created to provide a space for upgrading the electricity grid, which in turn would satisfy the policy towards renewables? One of the, well, it's the feasi feasibility study, uh, Mr Speaker, will um, hollow out much more, much more detail the areas where we think an investment fund could be investing in, in into the future. Uh, and this is, this is something which is, is trying to take a very long-term view to infrastructure investment. Um, energy production, uh, energy efficiency and renewables are, are some of the categories that in consultation with the European Investment Bank uh, we have identified as areas which might, be, um, might present opportunities for, for investment. Uh, and there, those, are, those are areas and some of the others like social housing um, and urban regeneration are areas in which uh, government has an interest in the investment of but doesn't always lead or take the key role in investing in. Um, so energy production is one that it might be. I, I don't want to prejudice what might happen in terms of both the feasibility study or indeed what might be um, uh, given money out of the or, or lent money out of the fund from in the future. But there are any number of different energy production um, projects or schemes uh, that are rolling out across Northern Ireland or in the pipeline or in development, various stages of development that could avail of this. Let's bear in mind it is a, it is a, a fund of, um, in the, the outstate, outset, we hope it will be around uh, a billion pounds in size, uh, primed by up to about 100 million pounds of, of the executive's own funds. So there will, be, there will be some energy production or infrastructure schemes which would be um, able to swallow up all of that billion pounds very, very quickly. Um, and it may be sort of smaller scale energy pro production projects at the outset, but there wouldn't be anything. I, mean, I think one thing I would stress again, Mr. Speaker, is this is very much a long term fund that we're looking at that we want to see grow from a billion pounds into much more. Um, and the possibilities are, are therefore um, quite exciting about what might be funded in the future. Can I call Mr. William Humphrey? Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister how will the Northern Investment Fund be financed? We, we, we are, um, Mr. Speaker, try, we, the executive has agreed for an indicative allocation of uh, over £40 million to the uh, investment fund in 15-16. 
uh, to kickstart it, to get some finances into its, into its balance sheet. Uh, we hope that that will be able to leverage in uh, additional finance, first and foremost from the European Investment Bank, who have been working with incredibly closely on this uh, project right from roughly this time last year. Uh, and I have to pay tribute to the EIB for their uh, engagement, for their work in the, the genesis of this fund, their work uh, throughout the last year, uh, and I look forward to their input into the feasibility study and indeed uh, as partners in taking the fund forward. Um, myself and, and indeed the EIB are not against trying to draw in other finances from elsewhere. Um, so obviously they're, they're keen to top up what we put in, um, but they have encouraged us to look at other opportunities to finance the investment fund. And I don't want to, and it was, it was raised by someone during the budget debate earlier, and I don't want to get into details about who they might be, uh, but we are beginning conversations, Mr. Speaker, with uh, other large-scale international, uh, potential international investors who might be able to take the initial £1 billion that's in the fund up to a much higher level and therefore be able to do much more for Northern Ireland in terms of developing our infrastructure. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers? Of course, it's described as a leverage fund. But could the Minister just tell the House uh, what are the key strategic drivers uh, to enable that leverage to happen and inform what specific projects would ultimately be picked? That sort of work is, is that, that's, that's exactly why. And I know sometimes it can be frustrating that we have a lot of process in, in delivering things like this, so a feasibility study. Some people might say, well, can you not just get on with it and identify the sort of schemes that you want to fund? Uh, this, this is, I, th I think it's an absolutely uh, essential stage in it all. That will, that will, whilst we have indicated some areas of investment and in infrastructure where it might be possible, um, so social housing, uh, urban regeneration, energy efficiency, energy production being, being amongst, amongst those, I don't think it's limited to that. Perhaps it might, might be limited in the short term because of the volume of money that might be in the fund, but in the longer term, there could be, as we leverage in more funding, there might be the opportunity to expand that even further. Um, I, I, I think it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity that we have through this fund to do things on a scale that we haven't done before. We have, from a, particularly from a public sector side, it has been conventional capital that we have used to invest in infrastructure, and that has traditionally gone to roads infrastructure or uh, hospitals or new schools or whatever. This is, this is the ability for us on a large scale for a large number of years to invest in those other sorts of infrastructure, which are clearly of economic but also of social benefit to, to Northern Ireland. Um, so I look forward to the feasibility of your study coming back and, and dealing with many of the issues that the member has raised and, and, and giving us the, the confidence to move forward um, with creating the fund and leveraging in those finances that, from the EIB in the first instance and also to try to work with other potential international investors who might be able to might see the attraction of investing in Northern Ireland. I think all of us would appreciate that there is a, has been an underinvestment in our broad infrastructure over the last 10, 20 years or so, and I think that's where there is a, a great opportunity for those investors, some of which we have already spoken to, who see the potential of investing in Northern Ireland. I think that's what's going to attract these sorts of players who haven't really been in Northern Ireland or entertained investing in Northern Ireland in the past. I think this is, this is a vehicle which will, I think, bring those sorts of uh, players to the table. Thank you. And I call Mr Peter Weir. Uh, question number three, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, plans to develop a voluntary exit scheme for the Northern Ireland Civil Service are well advanced. The Executive agreed the preferred option at its meeting on 5 February. It is intended that the scheme will be launched on 2 March 2015 and will be open to virtually all civil servants, including part-time staff below permanent secretary and analogous grades. We anticipate that those selected to leave under the scheme will do so in tranches between 30 September 2015 and 31 March 2016. The overarching objective of the Civil Service Voluntary Exit Scheme is a permanent NICS pay bill reduction in the 2015-16 financial year and beyond. Civil Service Departments have advised that the pay bill savings they need to make via the Voluntary Exit Scheme in 2015-16 equate to approximately £26 million and around £88 million per year thereafter. This is based on indicative numbers provided by departments of around 2,410 full-time equivalent posts to be suppressed. These figures assume there will be sufficient applications to affect this quantum of pay bill savings. However, due to the voluntary nature of the scheme, it is not possible to be definitive at this early stage, either as to the numbers who will be released or the savings that can be generated as a result of the scheme. The indicative pay bill savings have been calculated using the median salary by grade of the total full-time equivalent posts required to be released to generate the required savings. Staff will be released in tranches throughout the period 
September 2015 and uh, March 2016. This means that the full six months pay bill savings will only be realised for those released in the first tranche, with the pay bill savings reduced for those released in later tranches. The £88 million pounds pay bill savings represents a full 12 month period when all staff have been released. For supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister why a voluntary exit scheme was considered necessary rather than the alternative options that he outlined were considered as well? Mr. Speaker, the, the, the objective, as I, as I said in my answer, uh, first answer, was, is a, a permanent pay bill reduction. And that's, of course, in the context of trying to deal with uh, significant pressures on our budget next year. And even though those pressures uh, were able to be closed somewhat by the allocation of a further £150 million in the, the final budget. Some departments are obviously dealing with the significant reductions, in the, including my own department, uh, next year. So it's a permanent pay bill reduction, which is a, the, the, the number one objective in this. It is, I have to say, one of, and it's again worth reiterating, one of a number of strategic personnel interventions. Uh, other ones include uh, recruitment freeze and embargo on promotions and the suppression of, of what are called funded vacancies within departments. Um, doing those uh, interventions alone will save um, in 2015-16 an estimated £30 million. Pounds. Now, that's, that's a very welcome saving. It's perhaps as, uh, a little less painful than perhaps some other interventions might be, but as you can see, £30 million is very welcome isn't going to deal with the pressures that departments are facing. Uh, a voluntary exit scheme is necessary because it will achieve much larger savings and will do so much quicker than recruitment freeze might be able to achieve. Uh, time is, is, is of the essence as well, and that's why we need to progress uh, with the scheme very quickly. And I'm glad that the executive have agreed uh, in recent weeks to proceed with the scheme, which will allow it to be opened uh, to staff at the very beginning of March. Uh, and we're still on timetable to release the first tranche of people by around September time of this year, which will allow departments to realise, certainly from that first tranche of people who go, uh, six months' worth of salary savings, which again will help them to live within their means and set them up very well to make further savings, uh, full year savings uh, in future financial years. Thank you. And I call Mr. Jim Allister. Yes, I want to ask the Minister something I've asked him by written question, but he's notoriously so about answering those, so I still haven't got an answer. How long would it take? under natural wastage and recruitment freeze to run up the saving of 20,000 posts across the public service? Because that is obviously a key question in balancing whether or not it is wise to borrow £700 million to fund an exit scheme. Yeah, I know the, the member has, has asked a written question and, and um, it's uh, something that he will appreciate that sometimes the answers that come back first uh, throw up issues that I would like to, to tease out as well so that I can give the member, or indeed any member in this House, um, a good answer and the answer to the question that they want. Um, the lever rate for the civil service is roughly 4%, um, which would mean that next year you, you would ordinarily expect just over 1,000 uh, members of staff to leave for whatever reason that might be, and that can be retirement or just deciding to go. Um, so even to that, the member will appreciate therefore that to realise the savings um, or to, to get to release 2,400 people, which is the numbers that the department have then identified that they need less and fewer of next year, wouldn't be achieved by a recruitment freeze alone or um, other measures. Um, so that's where, and in reply to Mr. Weir, I pointed out the time is of the essence of the civil service needs 2,400 next year. We are not going to achieve that alone by um, recruitment freezes, and the same would obviously apply across the 20,000 figure uh, across the, the whole of the public sector. Now, recruitment freezes and indeed those other strategic personnel interventions will play a key part in getting us to 20,000, but given the pressure that there is on public finances immediately, so from the next number of weeks into the start of the next financial year, it is essential therefore that in order to realise those savings uh, those sizable savings that a voluntary exit scheme is required. Now, I, I make no hesitation in saying that it is far from an ideal course of action to be, to be taking, but it does reflect the experience that was done elsewhere. So if you go to Whitehall back in 2010, a voluntary exit scheme was exactly what they did as well, and they've been able to reduce their size of the, the public sector ser service by around 10%. We have done nowhere near that, and that's why we need to do what we are doing now. Um, and the simple answer, I suppose, is that 
whilst recruitment freezes are part of the equation, they wouldn't realise the quantity of savings or indeed the number of people to leave the service quickly enough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, is there a preferred plan B, if, uh, which need, would need to be considered if uh, the voluntary exit scheme is not accepted by staff or if the desired grades uh, of the civil service? <laughs> I think there, there are a degree of. I mean, I, I accept this point too. There is a degree of risk in proceeding with such an ambitious, such a radical scheme over such a short period of time. And one of those risks is, is the, the member identifies that it might be undersubscribed. Um, now, I think that um, my belief is, and certainly anecdotally, the evidence coming back is that there will be no issue or problems in the, the first year, or indeed perhaps the first couple of years. I think the fact that it is a scheme. Uh, taking place over a four-year period. There will be many for whom voluntary exit doesn't work now, doesn't suit their particular circumstances, whatever they are, but that perhaps in the third or fourth year it may suit their, their circumstances. Um, now, the executive has agreed to proceed with a voluntary exit scheme. It hasn't considered any other option at this stage, but clearly if um, it didn't work or didn't realise the savings that we were anticipating, we would have to come back and look at perhaps what other options might be there. Um, but we would do that, obviously, in the context of what is a, a changing um, budgetary environment. And whilst we have predicted the need to reduce the headcount by 20,000 uh, over a period of the next number of years, that's done on the basis of budget projections that were valid um, uh, six months ago. Uh, those budget, um, the reality of what the budget might be in the future may change. It may change positively. It may change negatively. So there are many things in respect of this type of issue around budgets and the impact on the, the headcount need that we have within the civil service and the broad public sector, which are in, sometimes in a bit of a state of flux. So that, that's something that we will have to continually keep under review. But I, I don't think that there will be much escaping the need to reduce significantly uh, the number of people working within the public, broad public sector in Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question four. Mr. Speaker, the Joint Ministerial Task Force on Banking and Access to Finance has met four times now, most recently on the 2nd of February. My key focus in the task force has been to ensure that everything possible is being done to improve access to finance for local businesses. And in that regard, I am pleased to be able to say that the lending environment is improving, with more businesses successfully securing the finance they need to prosper and grow. But I also recognise that challenges remain for many of our firms. That is why I have been pressing to ensure that the benefits of national initiatives are being felt in Northern Ireland. Thankfully, we are seeing progress on this front, and the uptake of programmes delivered by the British Business Bank in Northern Ireland is improving, with the latest figures indicating that these have facilitated more than £40 million of lending and investment to businesses in Northern Ireland. Access to finance is a crucial issue, and I can assure the member that I will continue to press for suitable initiatives where they could have a positive impact in Northern Ireland. Nicole, Bradley, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. If I could just ask the Minister to elaborate further and maybe outline what the current volume of lending by banks is to local business. Mr. Mr. Speaker, one of the um, primary objectives of creating the Joint Ministerial Task Force, which I uh, sit on alongside the Economy Minister Arlene Foster, was to get better data about lending in Northern Ireland. Uh, many of us in the House will recall how, whenever the crisis began, and there was clearly a, a drop off the edge of the cliff in terms of lending in Northern Ireland, that we weren't, whilst we knew that was happening, we had no data to back up what we believed to be that to, to be the case. So we have been fighting a, a long battle, but thankfully a, a fruitful battle in terms of getting better data published, and we now receive, uh, on a quarterly basis, much better data from the British uh, Bankers Association. The latest figures uh, available are for the third quarter of 2014, and that showed that new approved borrowing by SMEs in Northern Ireland stood at £407 million in that quarter, and that was the highest quarterly amount since the data series had started back in 2010, and it was 15 per cent higher uh, in that period compared to the same period the year before. The approval rate for SME loans remains high at over 9 out of 10 applications being approved. Now, I appreciate that there will still be many issues. Uh, and that's why uh, the executive principally through Invest Northern Ireland continue to have a range of pro uh, products like the Growth Loan Fund, the Small Business Loan Fund, out in, out in the marketplace to assist those who still have difficulties from, from our banks um, from getting conventional finance. But I think those figures are testimony to the fact that just as our overall economy is changing, so is the availability of, of finance to businesses. And of course, 
whatever about the banks and what happened in the past. We need our banks to be functioning properly if we want our economy to be functioning properly. And I think all of us will welcome those very positive figures and the move in the right direction. I call Mr. John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm grateful to the, the minister uh, for his, his reply in the, to that regard. Um, the minister knows, and indeed he indicated in his reply, the importance of, of managing that two SMEs, and I include um, our farm sector that's going through a difficult uh, time at the moment. Does he have an opinion on whether uh, Northern Ireland needs more competition in its banking sector, more um, access to finance, more flexibility in financial products that are on offer, and indeed rebuilding those personal relationships between customers and their banks and moving away from this mentality of computer says no. I'd be grateful for the Minister's views on that. In some ways, my view is on the, sort of the, the structure of the Northern Ireland banking situation isn't um, going to change that structure. It, it is what it is. Now, there is, I think, there ha and there has been uh, an encouraging entrance of what might be described as challenger banks. Uh, the, the interesting thing about that is the challenger banks in Northern Ireland are the sort of established banks in, in the, uh, the mainland UK, so the likes of Barclays and Santander and HSBC are much more active in the business market in Northern Ireland, um, and obviously backed by pretty healthy balance sheets. Uh, and they are providing some competition for the four sort of local banks, even though none of them are owned locally. Um, but the four sort of four big traditional banks in, in Northern Ireland are being uh, are getting some competition from those those challenger banks. I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree with the, the access to finance implementation panel, panel, which Arlene and I created, made a point in its conclusions that you know, we didn't need to radically change the structure. We just, what we need more is, more is different products, recognising, Mr Speaker, that the, the, the lending environment has changed and probably changed utterly. Uh, and therefore, it isn't, it isn't a case of getting new banks coming into the market. And I wouldn't dissuade any new banks from getting into the market if they want to come. That, that's perfectly fine. That's a business decision for them. But what all banks, including those who are already established in Northern Ireland, need to do is, I think, uh, behave differently and, and produce different products. And that's why, again, Trader at the point that Invest Northern Ireland have moved into this space by providing products which can uh, offer a bit of a bridge sometimes between what they can get from um, regular and normal um, banks and perhaps what they, they need to take forward um, projects. So I think there is, it is in that space where different products and a, and a recognition that there are different ways to finance business growth is probably what needs to be appreciated more than the need to bring in more competition into the local market. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I wonder if the Minister would advise on what actions have been taken as, as a result of the access to finance a report, but the one that was produced by the Independent Economic Advisory Group last year. The, the uh, access to um, finance implementation panel um, has produced a, a very good set of recommendations, many of which are being progressed. One of the key ones uh, that we are continuing to, to progress between uh, my department, uh, the Department of Enterprise Trade and Investment, and indeed the British Business Bank, is the proposal to develop a, a property overhang fund in Northern Ireland. Um, as, as members will appreciate, um, it is that overhang of, of bad debt around property which is stifling the ability of many businesses in Northern Ireland to grow. So again, in, a, in an innovative and creative way, we are looking at trying to produce a product or a fund which would help to deal with that issue to allow those otherwise very solvent, very uh, able bank or businesses who are capable of growing to grow uh, and grow free from uh, the property overhang that, uh, that has been stifling their ability to grow. Okay, I'll call Mr. Uh, Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number six. Mr. Speaker, at a UK level, it is widely anticipated that the current trend of reducing public sector budgets will continue in the short to medium term. In that respect, we should anticipate resource Dell reductions and be planning accordingly. The precise impact of the forthcoming 2015 spending review on the executive's budget will ultimately be shaped by the policies of the incoming UK government and the degrees of protection that the new UK government will offer to comparable services such as health and education. I apologise. Questions, and uh, we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Ross Hussey. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister would be aware, as we mentioned earlier, the stress civil servants were working under. And I'm sure he and the members will agree with me the stress and the bravery of those who worked in police stations and the court service uh, during the Troubles. Uh, these people are still awaiting their, their, their pay claim to be settled, and I know there's, there's a legal issue in this. Perhaps the Minister would update the House as to where we are in relation to this specific issue. 
Mr. Speaker, the, the House and indeed the member will, will know and I hope appreciate that this is an issue that I have had a, a huge amount of sympathy for since uh, coming into office. Indeed, I uh, tasked officials in my department to look again at the issue. Uh, I brought forward a paper as a result of that work, brought forward a paper to the executive which I believe was capable of resolving uh, this issue. Unfortunately, uh, that paper has yet to be tabled before the executive and therefore a decision taken on it. I think that's regrettable. Uh, I think that there are some in this House who have pretended to be supportive of the very members of staff that uh, Mr Hussey speaks about. Uh, whenever a proposal to resolve the situation was put to them, uh, they have walked away uh, and haven't allowed that to be taken forward. I think that's deeply regrettable. Um, can I correct the member on, on one respect, or not correct them, but point out that um, there is no equal pay issue in this regard. That was something that was very clearly proven uh, by the courts and the judgment uh, by uh, Justice Babington in this regard um, over coming on a couple of years ago now. Um, but that still, in my view, doesn't take away from the, the very valid points that the member and indeed many members in, in this House have made to me uh, and are points that I recognise. Uh, and I hope that uh, those who have at least verbally supported the claims of these uh, and the calls by uh, these members of staff in the past can I actually back that up with some positive action. Mr. Hussey, supplement. Uh, I thank the Minister for his response. And again, the Minister is quite correct that uh, legally, uh, and he's made that clear in, in many responses, there's no valid equal pay claim. However, the, the civil service staff cons concerned clearly believe that they do have a valid claim. Uh, can you advise the House if and when you think this matter will be resolved, will it be resolved in the life of this Assembly? Because clearly we have civil servants uh, who are in distress that this matter is still ongoing some maybe five years after the initial claim. And, and, and I, I recognise the, the fact that having, Mr Speaker, taken a look at this issue again, having brought forward an executive paper which includes, I think, a satisfactory day, way to deal with the issue, which, which provided, while it's not dealing with any legal claim, because there isn't a legal claim, but dealing with the, the need to recognise um, the work that was done, um, that that hasn't proceeded. Um, I think it's regrettable, as I said before, that that hasn't been able to proceed. Uh, what I'm hopeful of is the changes uh, to the way the executive does business, Mr Speaker, uh, agreed at the, in the Stormont House talks, may allow this paper to be brought forward uh, in a way that it wouldn't have been able to in the past. Uh, that obviously doesn't uh, naturally and, uh, translate then into automatic agreement around the paper, um, but I will can assure the House, and more to the point, I can assure those members of staff who may be listening or reading what I'm saying, that I will bring that paper to the executive whenever I'm permitted to by the changes uh, in the way the executive does business, uh, and it is then up to those who have been holding it back to then put their money where their mouth is in respect of this issue, and I hope that. Um, in the not too distant future, we can get some resolution to this to this issue. Ms. Anne Lowe. Thank you. Uh, how does the finance minister reconcile the executive decision to funding uh, the premier uh, for teacher training colleges with stated executive commitment to a strategic budget, public sector reform, addressing the cause of division? and promoting a shared future. Mr Speaker, in, in respect of, of the issue of uh, teacher training uh, in Northern Ireland, I, I wouldn't deny, and indeed I, I've heard many in the House in the last number of weeks when this issue has been discussed, no one, including myself, would deny that reform is required. Uh, I think I would be one of the first to accept that we are still producing too many teachers in Northern Ireland. I think there's four different institutions that are producing qualified teachers. So I think there is a, there's an absolute need to reform the system. Um, I don't agree, and the executive hasn't agreed, with the way in which her, her colleague, indeed my colleague and the executive, the Minister for Employment and Learning, has gone about uh, trying to reach, achieve the desirable aim of reform. Um, you don't achieve change the way, in my view, in the way Minister Fari brought forward his proposals. There was no consultation. Um, there was no attempt to bring the colleges with them. There was no political consensus in this House because it was very clearly a motion was um, very uh, heavily passed. But I think it was 80 odd votes in favour of a proposal not to cut the premium uh, and to proceed with a sort of very blunt and very crude way 
by simply cutting the budgets of the colleges uh, in a very un, uh, unalliance fashion, I have to say, by just sort of doing that over the heads of those institutions and without consultation, uh, I think would have produced a perverse result. Uh, I think that the particularly Stranmalist College, which is of course located in our own South Belfast constituency, would have fallen by the wayside very, very quickly. Uh, and I don't think that would have been an intention or a consequence that any of us would have wanted. Certainly, I, I can, maybe some might, might want to see it, but certainly I didn't want to see that, and many in the House didn't want that to see, see happen. I think the decision that has been taken by the executive not to cut the premium gives us now the space to work with the colleges, gives an opportunity for consultation with the colleges to achieve that reform, which is absolutely required, but would not have been achieved in the way that any of us would have wanted by just crudely and bluntly cutting the budgets of the, um, of the colleges. Ms. Lowe for supplement. Thank you. I thank the Minister. But as the Minister admitted himself that we are training too many teachers, so I mean, how can the Minister justify using that excessive amount of public funding to train teachers, train in colleges, and neglecting maybe other very crucial areas of building up the economy? taking into account to also the need for, for, for skills building ahead of corporation tax? I, I, I think there are many um, areas of uh, higher level education where we are producing too many graduates. Uh, it's not just teacher training, there are many areas. Uh, and I welcome the fact that uh, the universities have been reducing places in some, what I think we would all agree, are in lower priority areas in terms of certainly our economic development. That's a, that's a, a good first step in terms of reforming in that direction. Uh, you know, this is, a, is not a problem which has appeared overnight. It has been a long-standing problem. There have been attempts to try to resolve it in the past, which were unsuccessful. I don't think, uh, as, as frustrated as the minister might be, as frustrated as many might be, um, I don't think you would have achieved. You may have achieved a reduction in the number of teacher training places because it may have forced the closure, particularly of Stranmalis College. That's not something that I wanted and indeed many wanted to see happen. Um, I think the best way to achieve a successful outcome, which everybody buys into, is to proceed on, a, on the basis that we, now have, we have now created a space to consult with the colleges, to bring them into the tent instead of keeping them outside, and try to work with them to agree a way forward. Now, if they fail to agree that way forward, then the executive and the minister will have to look at other ways in which to uh, achieve reform. But certainly by doing it, by, just by crudely and bluntly cutting their budget and forcing them into slow but certain decline and uh, death was not the way to which to achieve reform. Thank you. And it comes to David Hildich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the Minister will be aware of the campaign led in Northern Ireland by the pubs of Ulster, calling on the Chancellor to reduce the rate of VAT for the hospitality sector. What support has the Minister afforded this campaign? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have, um, whenever I was uh, on the back benches in this, this chamber not that long ago, I, I brought a motion to the chamber calling on the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer to reduce. Uh, the rate of VAT for hospi the hospitality sector, as he is uh, permitted to do under EU law, uh, and mirroring what has happened, the experience that happened in the, the Irish Republic, where they have very successfully reduced the rate of um, VAT for the hospitality sector. Um, what I have done um, lately, my colleague, um, or my predecessor, uh, Mr. Wilson, um, followed that up uh, with the uh, Treasury uh, back then about two years ago. I have, in the last number of weeks, written again to the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, David Gawk, uh, building on the campaign, um, which the member uh, highlights, Mr. Speaker, led by pubs of Ulster, but also backed by many other uh, hospitality sector uh, bodies in Northern Ireland, and indeed further beyond, that the rate of um, VAT for the hospitality sector should be reduced. One of the points that I made to uh, the Treasury Minister was that uh, my, my counterpart, the Irish Finance Minister, Michael Noonan, uh, in his budget in, in October, um, said that and uh, confirmed that the VAT cut for the hospitality sector, for certain parts of the hospitality sector in the Irish Republic, would be cut indefinitely. And the reason he took that was that, that decision was that there was, a, there was an independent evaluation which showed that the reduced rate um, in VAT for the hospitality sector in, in the Republic, where it's down at 9% for some categories, uh, has produced uh, 30,000 um, 30, uh, new jobs, increased employment in the hospitality sector in the Irish Republic and has brought a benefit to the Irish Exchequer of €165 million. Euros. And it's that compelling case that I want to back pubs of Ulster and indeed other organisations are pushing for this cut um, to see the same thing happen across the UK. 
Thank you. And I call Mr. Hildich for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for, for his answer. Given that, Minister, are you hopeful that the rate of AT for the hospitality sector will be reduced? I, th I think the fact that the, 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 there is now a, a broad campaign across the, the whole of the United Kingdom, um, Mr. Speaker, I mean, it was not VAT, you're, you're not permitted to reduce VAT rates within regions of, of member states. You can do it across the whole of a state, and, and the EU are permitted specifically within the hospitality sector. Uh, and I think that there is, I think the fact that there is now a broad-based campaign right across the UK is helpful. I think the fact that we have this evidence from our near neighbours in the Irish Republic of how successful it can be, not just in boosting tourism numbers, but boosting employment, and then actually bringing a, a net benefit to the Irish Exchequer. And I think this is the point that I would labour with the Treasury, where you have, um, you have, yes, a reduction in VAT revenue because you've reduced the rate. But because of that increased employment and obviously the increased PAYE uh, receipts, the national insurance contributions that go up, the, the profits that companies within the hospitality sector will make and the tax that they will pay on it, that over time it can actually yield a, a benefit, a net benefit for, for the exchequer. Uh, uh, clearly it would be something that the UK government will have to consider in the round of the pressures that they are facing in public spending just as we are facing pressures and I can sympathise with um, Treasury colleagues in having to take those sorts of decisions but I think the fact that we have now, good evidence, strong evidence from the Irish Republic that this policy, when pursued, can work and can work substantially well for the Irish Republic, that there's no reason why it shouldn't happen across the UK as well. I wonder could the Minister give us an update on his recent meeting with the Welsh Minister for Finance? Um, we had a, a, a very useful, as I regularly meet with um, um, ministers from other devolved regions, a very positive meeting with Jane Hutt, the uh, Welsh Finance Minister at the start of the year. Um, it was a, a meeting that um, she was particularly very keen to, to have to, to learn of the experience that we had had in the Stormont House Agreement. Um, not the discussion about the very late nights and long lengthy discussions, but the results coming out of the Stormont House Agreement, particularly around financial flexibility and borrowing. And um, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure Jane wouldn't mind me saying this, that there are a lot of, particularly around the flexibilities around borrowing and the ability to borrow to offset uh, resource pressures in respect of a voluntary exit scheme, the ability to hold on to receipts from major asset sales and actually convert some of that into resource expenditure is something that the Welsh Government, in their pursuit of more powers around borrowing, they have only an ability to borrow uh, up to £400 million, whereas our ability is to borrow £3 billion. Uh, I think that's something, those are flexibilities that the Welsh Government and I'm sure the, the Scottish Government as well would be quite interested in uh, and would like to take forward in our conversations with um, UK Government Ministers. Ian, for a supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder, has he scheduled in a, a similar meeting with his uh, Southern Irish colleague? I, I meet uh, regularly. Um, with uh, Brendan Howland, who is the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Uh, I do meet with Michael Noonan regularly as well, but in terms of budgeting and uh, public spending matters and indeed reform matters, it is, is with Brendan Howland that I have most engagement. He and I meet regularly to uh, SEUPB, North South Ministerial um, Council um, uh, bilaterals. We also meet at plenaries, but we use those opportunities to have broader discussions about our uh, respective responsibilities, and um, we've been taking forward. Uh, particularly work around reform and the experience that the Irish government has had in reforming their public sector. Uh, and we've been trying to learn some lessons from their experience, and equally they have been trying to learn some experiences from, from our um, reforms of, of, of government here in Northern Ireland. So it is a, a good, healthy, productive relationship where there is a lot of shared mutual interest, and, and certainly I want to keep it that way and to continue to learn from each other on an ongoing basis. Minister, and that brings us to the end of the period for topical questions. And we will now